Welcome to Bloomington Today. I'm Kaylin Cockreel. Thanks for joining us. With record snowfall in Bloomington this winter, city officials have growing concern about the possibility of flooding now that snow has slowly begun to melt. We spoke with civil engineer Scott Anderson to discuss ways the city is preparing for the potential of rising water around Bloomington. So far this winter, 80.2 inches of snow has fallen in the city of Bloomington. And as spring nears, that record amount of white stuff needs to go somewhere. City officials have been forming a plan of action to prepare for the potential for rising water in area watersheds. In addition to the snowfall, uh, we had above moisture levels in the soils coming into winter as well as, as high water levels and precipitation last fall, all combining uh, to make that a potential for this spring. The Watershed District has partnered with the city to provide some predictions as to where potential problem areas lie. Right now, that is primarily along Nine Mile Creek, the Minnesota River, and some low-lying areas adjacent to ponds. Snow and ice still cover quite a bit of the questionable waterways, but with some warming forecasts in the near future, the city may need to take action, and it's well prepared. Number one, the city is trying to, to notify residents that this could be an issue and something that, that should be thought of um, uh, by having information on the website as well as sending out information to some targeted areas. Um, the city's also uh, has sand and sandbag materials on hand that will be available um, for delivery um, as needed um, as flooding, uh, if flooding becomes imminent. Um, the Public Works is also undertaking additional inspections of all the creek crossings along Nine Mile Creek to ensure that those are open and flowing uh, to their maximum capacity. The city has material on hand for close to 50,000 sandbags. Miscellaneous areas of temporary street flooding are likely to occur as snow and ice plug catch basins and surface drains. Anderson urges residents to simply pay attention to nearby bodies of water as snow begins to melt. Be aware of your surroundings. Um, they're most familiar with their, with their homes and their property and, and if they're adjacent to a water body or the creek, um, you know, just know and keep an eye on the, on the the weather, the snow melt, any rain events, um, watch those water levels just to, to be aware of what potentially could happen and know, um, you know what to do in terms of um, if there is flooding, do they have to, uh, are they going to be focused on protecting you know, a couple basement windows or a walkout entry or you know, where would the areas of water entry be most likely to their, their house. So just kind of just be aware of their surroundings primarily. The city is asking for assistance in reporting flooded areas. Please contact the Maintenance Division at 952-563-8760 if you're calling between the hours of 7 a.m. and 3.30 p.m. After hours, you can contact the Non-Emergency Police Line at 952-563-4900. That's also the contact information if you'd like the sandbagging supplies delivered to your area. We'll keep you updated right here on Bloomington Today with all the latest forecasts of the rising water around the city. In addition, city officials want to urge residents to take a second look at the position of their sump pump. Melting snow causes water levels within storm sewers to rise, and this time of year, sump pumps are working overtime to keep your basements clear of water. Utility civil engineer Tim Campa explains just what a sump pump does. It's designed to uh, protect the lower levels of the building from uh, seepage due to um, the groundwater seeping through the outside of the foundation and could cause flooding or damp basements, that type of thing. The sump pump, what it primarily consists of is a, a drainage pipe that 
goes around the perimeter of the building and it collects that seepage and directs it all to a sump basket. It's usually about a, oh, a 15 to 25 gallon basket where the pump is located. And then the pump uh, lifts that, pumps that water up and away from the house out into the yard. Uh, it's very important that uh, the discharge pipe be located so it's not being discharged into a sanitary sewer and so it's getting it far enough away from the house so that it's not coming back down the foundation and being pumped again. If some pumps are incorrectly draining into a sanitary sewer meant for dirty water, like showers, toilets, and sinks, rather than the storm sewers meant for clean water, like snowmelt and rainwater, sewers can flood, leaving nowhere for raw waste to go, but right back to where the sump pump originates, your basement. There's a lot more of the clear water, the snowmelt and the rainfall. The sanitary sewer system was designed specifically to take the sanitary sewer flows, the domestic sewage from the buildings. When that storm water makes its way or the clear water makes its way into the sanitary, it gets to be too much. And we start seeing uh, backups of raw sewage into buildings, uh, homes and businesses. Clean water or clear water is continually monitored by utilities officials to ensure there is little to no overflow into the sanitary sewer system and pipes are repaired immediately if a leak is detected between the two sewers. Flow monitoring is also available in parts of Bloomington that have higher rates of water within the sanitary sewer system. That way, city officials can alert residents to the potential for sewer backups and have people make sure their sump pump is draining correctly. If you're wondering if your sump pump is properly placed to drain, Campus says simply follow the pipes. If it's going to a floor drain or a laundry tub, that's an improper connection. If all else fails, call the city. A utilities employee would be happy to help. And one local nonprofit organization is celebrating its fifth anniversary. We were on site as the company continued doing what it does best, providing Bloomington Public Schools with classroom essentials. Take a look. Pencils, notebooks, erasers, glue, all tools that are vital for young people to succeed in the classroom. But like many things, the cost of school supplies can add up. Companies to Classrooms is an organization that recognizes that cost while taking into account the notion that those supplies are plentiful, sometimes overstocked in many businesses' supply rooms. What we do is take surplus office supplies and equipment from businesses and then we place it in this area, in this, our, our warehouse, where teachers can take whatever they can use in their classrooms for free. Bloomington Public Schools were the first beneficiaries of this program and have since expanded to servicing Richfield and Shakopee Public Schools. One question we wanted to know was just how much waste could area companies be disposing that is usable? There's approximately 300,000 tons of corporate waste annually and 90% of that is actually usable. And I don't blame businesses for that. They have to remain competitive, and in order to do that, they're constantly changing. And every time they do a change, if it's a name change, a move, a logo change, that generates some kind of surplus. But it's also surplus that teachers can benefit from because they can use the paper, they can use the pens, they can use the promotional items. There are a limited number of companies to classrooms around the country. We also wanted to know what has kept the Bloomington location flourishing for five years now. We operate on all volunteer help, and that's really instrumental in keeping our costs down. And so we've, we've been embraced by the community as far as the teachers, uh, older people in the community, um, anybody that is affiliated with education is more than happy to help us out in our mission. Companies to Classrooms ask that you think of them before you throw anything away. Donations are accepted not only from companies, but from residents as well. Some items needed are pencils, pens, crayons, notebook, paper, scissors, rulers, folders, and erasers. Volunteers are also always appreciated. For more information on Companies to Classrooms, call 952-888-7708 or visit their website at www.companiestoclassrooms.org. Well, now it's time for a short break. When we return, we're joined by Public Health Emergency Preparedness Specialist Jackie Weber. 
She'll be talking with us about a resident-based task force you may want to get involved with. Stay with us. Lead paint poisoning affects over one million children today. Dust from lead-based paint could cause violent behavior. If your home was built before 1978, log on to leadfreekids.org. Welcome back to Bloomington Today. We're now joined by Public Health Emergency Preparedness Specialist, Jackie Weber. How are you doing today? I'm well, thank you for Good. having me, Kaylin. Well, welcome. Let's just jump right into it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the CERT program? Yeah, well, CERT stands for Community Emergency Response Team. And it's really a grassroots initiative of the FEMA program, or the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And it's one of the umbrella um, volunteer citizen programs um, called Citizen Corps. So under that Citizen Corps umbrella, there are five volunteer programs, uh, federal volunteer programs. Okay. One is CERT, the Community Emergency Response Team. The second is Medical Reserve Corps, or MRC. The third is Neighborhood Watch. The fourth is uh, Fire Corps. And the fifth is Police and Volunteer Service, or VIPs. And so really it's, it's um, like I said, the grassroots organization and it's a partnership between the community, the local program, the local community and um, emergency responders. So we work closely with our, our city agencies, with police, fire, and EMS, um, as well as some other community partners, so private businesses and then our faith-based organizations as well. Oh, wow. Well, how would a, a Bloomington resident become involved with this? Yeah, it's a great program. It's a great way um, to, to get involved. So it, we offer trainings a couple times a year. Uh, right now we're on, we offer training twice a year. Okay. And you can sign up. There's information on the City of Bloomington website. If you just go to the city website and search keyword CERT, there's more information and uh, registration information on how to get involved. Um, and really what the program teaches, it's a 21-hour training course. So it's okay. fairly intensive um, but it really covers quite a bit of information so doing a, uh, we teach a lot of personal preparedness skills um, teach some very basic emergency response skills as well oh, okay well we kind of briefly touched on it but what exactly does this training entail yeah so we start with the, the very basic preparedness information. So we really are driving home the issue of you have to be prepared for any emergency. And it could be a snowfall. We've had plenty of snow this winter. Yes, it have. could be that, um, you know, with the recent events that happened in Japan, um, you know, things to start thinking about how to better be prepared for those types of emergencies. So we talk about how to build that preparedness kit for your family, for yourself, um, for your car, you know, we're traveling around the metro area, so if you get stuck somewhere in traffic or if something happens, a snowstorm, and you're stuck on the road to have some basic supplies in your car and in your workplace. And part of that preparedness kit includes food and water for at least three days for everybody in your family. So not just for you, but everybody in your family, including your pets. And, um, and you know, medications that everybody needs to take, um, you know, really specific things for, for you. Okay. Um, so we talk we start with that basic preparedness information uh, and then we go to a little bit more of the um, utility shutoffs. so where to identify utilities in your home your gas and your water shutoffs. how to shut them off safely if an emergency if you had to leave your home um, how to safely use a fire extinguisher and properly use a fire extinguisher to put out a fire um, we teach very basic f um, first aid skills so how to control bleeding, monitor shock, those types of situations, and then also do some uh, light search and rescue skills. So it's, it's really a combination of both classroom and hands-on learning. So in the classroom, we're teaching the skills, and then the hands-on part, we actually practice them and actually do them. Gosh. Yeah. Well, you know, it is information that everyone should know just yes. in case. Absolutely. That's the, that's the key thing is Absolutely. just in case. Well, I know that... Um, we have some items here. Once uh, members of the community are in this this program, yep. signed up for it, they get this kit. Why yeah. don't we talk a little yeah. bit about it? So that's great. So everybody that participates in the training gets this cert kit. It's a very basic starter kit. We really encourage folks to enhance and add okay. um, as they need it. And in this kit is um, some very basic. Um, 
preparedness and response skills, uh, excuse me, preparedness and response uh, tools. So a flashlight, you can never have too many flashlights. Um, eye, protective eyewear, um, a helmet to protect your head, a very basic first aid kit. This is a utility shut off tool to turn off your gas. Oh, um, okay. And then some um, leather gloves just to protect your hands if you're out and about and, and working. You always want to keep your, yourself protected as well. Okay. Then some suggestions maybe to, to enhance. I know when I'm growing up, my dad always had us keep blankets in the back of the car, yes. extra snow Good. boots <laughs> just in case. What other things do you suggest that people think to enhance with? I know you'd mentioned medications and food. Yep, um, a small notebook and oh. a writing utensil, a pen or a pencil is really good. So when you're okay. out and about, just to be able to make some notes or leave a note for somebody. Oh. Um, food is really good, a couple bottles of water. Um, you know, maybe some um, duct tape is really you. Uh, you know, how many Make uses? Not right. <laughs> how many uses for duct tape? So the the kit does include um, some duct tape, but we always encourage uh, folks to to add more. Okay. Um, a sharpie is a really good tool to use um, to be able to make notes again and, and write on surfaces. So right. those are just some very basics that we encourage folks to add. Okay. Well, once. Let's fast forward a little bit. Once someone has gone through the 21-hour program yep. um, and become a certain member, what exactly is their role then in the community? Once you complete the training and you become part of the Bloomington team, there's additional, a few extra steps, so going through um, a criminal background check, completing a criminal background check, and then also completing a city volunteer application. So once you complete those steps, then your role in the community really is um, is quite robust, um, participating. Really, you're a leader or a champion in the community yes. for your neighborhood, uh, for your community, working with your block captains. We really encourage that so you can help spread the, the word about preparedness and reach out to your neighbors. Um, you know, maybe there are some people in your block who um, have large families and making sure that they know how to be prepared for their family and for their children, or maybe some elderly folks in your neighborhood. Um, really participating in community outreach and education events as well. Okay. Um, so there's the Bloomington Summer FET. Um, we were active at the farmers market in the, over the summer and participated in National Night Out. Um, we had a booth at the um, Minnesota State Fair during Governor's Fire Prevention Day. So we, we encourage CERT members to come with us just to help again spread the good word and share their experiences as being a CERT member. Mm -hmm. um, and then really um, as I said earlier, being a champion in the community. So it's, it's working. We know then people who, who are trained in CERT, we know that they're a resource for the community. We know that they're a resource in their neighborhood. So if something happens, again, snowstorm mm -hmm. <laughs> or power goes down, um, high winds, that happens often in Bloomington, um, you know, that they're a resource until emergency services can arrive. Absolutely. And if there is a, a wider spread emergency or disaster, they can definitely supplement it by offering supportive services to our police and fire, um, EMS services and public health services um, if, if there is something bigger that happens in Bloomington. Absolutely. Yeah. So they play a wide role absolutely. of, of, of Many things hats around to the, wear. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Well, when, when is the next opportunity that residents can get involved with this? We do have a training coming up in May. Um, it's, a, it's a full weekend commitment. It's May 13th, 14th, and 15th. Okay. So it's Friday night from 5 to 9, and then all day Saturday and all day Sunday. Um, you can get that information by going to the City of Bloomington website and, again, searching keyword CERT okay. uh, for more information. And we do partner with the City of Richfield. So this time, uh, the spring training will be held at the Richfield Community Center over on, um, it's, uh, the address is 7000 Nicollet Avenue. Okay. All right. Well, I guess kind of to sum everything up, why does public health feel that this is an important program to get our residents involved with? Yeah, you know, in a in a public health emergency, we are going to be short of of, of people to respond. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a fairly small health department um, with only about 50 people and in a public health emergency, we're going to need a lot more people to to get medication or whatever the situation mm -hmm. is out into the community and recognize that there is a, a huge gap in that plan. And so we identified that there is a need for volunteers. Um, and so we 
you know, the, like I said, the um, CERT program is a federal program, so it's all federally funded uh, through FEMA and then through the Minnesota Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Um, so I went after some grant funds and were able to identify this, and it's really bridged the gap between what services that we are able to offer and how to make those better services in the future with more volunteers. Okay, great. Yeah. That sounds good. Well, great. We'd like to thank Jackie for being here today with us, and again, if anyone would like like to get involved with the CERT program, we encourage you to visit the city's website at www.ci.bloomington.mn.us, keyword search CERT, C-E-R-T, and then you'll have all the information right there. It's time for a short break. We will be back. Stay with us. This financial advisor is being accused of committing one of the largest investment frauds in the history of the United States. I guess we're not going to Aspen. That's fine. You see, I like tennis balls. He likes insider trading. So he's going to jail and I'm going to a shelter. And no, they're not the same thing. Shelters are for good pets that want to be adopted. Jails are for criminals. I've done nothing. Uh-oh. Okay, I stole a cheeseburger once on my dog. Welcome back, everyone. It's now time for another City Faces segment, where we'll take you into a day in the lives of a Bloomington city worker and see how they're meeting the city's mission of providing quality services at an affordable rate. Today, we'll step into the shoes of city park keeper, Mike Dockin. Take a look. Mike Dockin has been a city employee for nearly 34 years. I'm a park keeper too in the park maintenance department. One of the main responsibilities of a park keeper is keeping Bloomington Kempt under various weather conditions. During the summertime, um, I run a large-scale mower and mow uh, irrigated turf areas that they use for athletic fields. Um, in the wintertime, it's uh, primarily snow removal and uh, maintenance of the skating rink areas. Park keepers are also dedicated to keeping the Bloomington community safe. We're on call, you know, 24-7. So, um, you know, I may get called in to do forestry work if there's a storm in the summertime. Uh, come in on the weekends or holidays to do snow plowing and removal. Um, so there's a, a lot of things like that. Also when we have big events, whether it's summer fat or big uh, ball tournaments, uh, we may get called on to work extra hours to make those things happen. Mike must always be prepared for new and unexpected tasks. Usually during a week you're gonna, you're gonna do 10 or 15 different things. And uh, there's great people to work with. Um, they, they're intelligent, they're quick, and um, you know, it's, it's uh, always a, a good time to come to work because there's always going to be something going on. Mike is also able to take pride in the camaraderie he shares with his coworkers. There's such a wealth of knowledge uh, with the people I work with that um, there's usually somebody around that can point you in the right directions for something. As a resident of Bloomington, Mike is able to see how what he does benefits the entire community. Being a citizen of Bloomington, raised here and stuff, um, I grew up really valuing the parks and, and uh, the city in general. And um, I, I think most of the people I work with take a lot of pride in providing you know, quality service uh, at reasonable prices. And uh, uh, we wind up you know, feeling really good about uh, making our parks in, in good condition for people to use them. And uh, we're actually uh, happy to see the parks get a lot of use out of them because we feel that it's really worthwhile. So I, I think it's, uh, you hear people talk, um, I was involved with BAA and my kids played sports and things like that. So you hear the other parents talk about how much they appreciate the park system. To see other City Faces stories, visit the city's YouTube channel and continue to tune in to Bloomington today where we'll bring you more of an average day in the shoes of one of Bloomington's employees. And if you're one of the many residents who work in the hotel, retail, or restaurant industry around Bloomington, give yourself a round of applause. In case you missed it, the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau honored award-winning hospitality employees at the 15th Annual Diamond Service Awards. The hospitality industry is big and successful in the city of Bloomington, and it's because of all of you. You're going above and beyond the call of duty to keep it that way and to make it that way. And everybody who comes and stays in our community, everybody who eats and visits is just taken care of. 
Hundreds of people gathered together on March 13th at the Sheraton Bloomington Hotel as 17 outstanding hospitality employees were honored for their contribution and dedication to customer service and hospitality. The recipients of this year's Diamond Service Awards were chosen from over 400 nominees, submitted by hotel, retail, and restaurant management. The nominees were interviewed by independent judges and scored. 85 finalists were honored at the gala in 17 award categories. Categories included Best Server, Best Hotel Housekeeping, and Best Valet, just to name a few. The City of Bloomington presented the Food Safety Award. Food establishments are nominated by Bloomington Health Inspectors based on their 2010 health inspection results. The Diamond Service Awards is the only event of its kind in Minnesota and one of the few within the United States. The event is similar to the Academy Awards in structure and voting, created and initiated by the Bloomington Convention and Visitors Bureau. Congratulations to all award recipients and nominees alike. Thank you for your award-worthy hospitality. Well, back in February, Bloomington Today brought you news of a new name and new look in the future for what has formerly been known as Mall of America's Underwater Adventures. As of mid-March, the new Sea Life Minnesota is open to the public under new ownership. This multi-million dollar makeover is sure to please everyone, from young kids to adults alike. The number of animals in the various exhibits went from around 5,000 to more than 10,000. The new aquarium has an Atlantis theme with numerous interactive play areas where people can get their hands wet. The last change in the aquarium came in 2009 and 2010 when the Seahorse Kingdom and Jellyfish Discovery exhibits were added. Both those attractions have stayed throughout the construction. Everyone is encouraged to get out to the Mall of America and take this amazing tour through the new Sea Life Minnesota. Well, here's one sure sign that spring is on its way. The 2011 Summer Youth Program sign-up has begun. Summer Spectrum offers area youth the opportunity to enjoy games, sports, arts and crafts, and other special events, all supervised by adult instructors experienced in working with children and recreation at a very low cost. Swimming and water safety, volunteer and leadership opportunities, youth softball, Tennis, Camp Coda, and Dakota Language Camp are just a few of the awesome activities offered through Bloomington Parks and Recreation Division. There are several ways to register for Summer Spectrum. Avoid the lines and sign up online 24 hours a day, or you can register by mail, via fax or email, or in person. To see a full guide to all activities offered to area youth, visit the city's website. Keyword search summer activities or you can call 952-563-8877. Well, that'll do it for this week's episode of Bloomington Today. For more information on city projects, parks, road construction, and events, visit the city's website. To view past episodes of Bloomington Today, as well as other city productions, visit Bloomington's YouTube channel. That and so much more is online right now at www.ci.bloomington.mn.us. We'll do you even one better. Sign up for eSubscribe to have updates sent to your email or cell phone. This is Bloomington Today, a production of the City of Bloomington's Communications Division. I'm Kaylin Cockreel. Thanks so much for joining us.